ですね。Mutual practice team and Pia for that expert organizational work that you've done. It's a privilege to be with your valued clients here today, and it gives me joy to see so many familiar faces and to know that so many of you are joining us remotely as well. Now, why does it give me joy to see you? Well, because at heart, the insurance and the reinsurance business is founded on relationships. Relationships, in turn, are built on communication and trust. And this conference, especially the ability to meet face to face, allows this communication, talking to each other, learning from each other, having ideas, and the opportunity to deepen those relationships, to deepen the trust that we have. As Dave mentioned, the relationships that many of you had with Guy Carpenter go back decades. The relationships that many of you have in your communities, in your counties, in the states where you operate go back centuries. Chris and others at Philadelphia contribution ship going on 300 years, and you can't beat that. I'm delighted to be here also because I see so many people that I've met before, and it's、uh, good to be with you in this conference. I was at the inaugural conference about eight years ago, and I go to about 15 to 20 conferences a year as a speaker or as a participant. And this is my favorite conference because of the people that. I see time and again Chris and、uh, Brian and Vince from、uh, Franklin,、uh, Steve Linkus from、uh, Hartford Mutual. Now, many of you know me, and by way of bringing you up to date on the recent change, what I'm doing now that I've joined R Street. The R Street Institute is a think tank based in Washington D.C. I'm working remotely from Connecticut. I'm still an analyst of the property casualty insurance industry. But my focus now at R Street, in the、uh, public policy world, is to influence the development of public policy that impacts property casualty insurance in a positive way, advancing free market, free enterprise, limited government solutions with work in state capitals and federally at the at the state level. So I'm not lobbying. I'm not a lobbyist, but trying to influence public policy in that way. And my agenda at R Street, the agenda of my team that focuses on insurance, looks at trends in liability insurance, looking at the Florida property market. Last week I was in Tallahassee, testifying to the Senate Appropriations Committee there, which voted for the reforms, which are much needed. So that was a step in the right direction. Also looking at risk-based rating, the ability to use rating factors. In personal lines, especially credit-based insurance scores, looking at ways to reform government programs that are trying to be or behave like insurance companies, but they have subsidies and issue signals, price signals, which are inefficient. And I'm talking about the National Flood Insurance Program and crop insurance. So these are the areas in which、uh, I'm engaging, and what I'm going to share with you today are highlights of. A theme that you hear on just about every earnings call of a publicly traded insurance company. You hear about it at conferences. You can't go to an confer- insurance conference without hearing something on social inflation, and also the trade press is full of it. Social inflation, and it's something that is impacting many of your books as well. And、uh, why are we talking about that? Well, rising liability awards are affecting、uh, insurance companies. We are reminded of the 1980s. Some of us are. Some of us that remember the 1980s and the great liability crisis when capacity in liability insurance、uh, dried up, and we had formations of Ace and XL in Bermuda. The great liability crisis, and I have a personal connection to that liability crisis because with the reforms that were introduced in the mid 1980s, with occurrence forms giving way to claims made to Stronger retentions to higher deductibles, changes in tort law, insurers got the situation more under control, and by 1986, insurers were flush with profits and were and were cash rich, and this caused some insurance companies to do something with their excess capital. They lowered their hiring standards and they let anyone in the door that could fog a mirror 
And I'm grateful for that because that's how I got my start in the insurance industry in 1986. So I have some positive things about the great insurance crisis. But today we're seeing some troubling signals. We're seeing adverse prior year reserve development at some companies. We're seeing skyrocketing rates for cyber insurance. And Tom and I were just talking about cyber insurance and DNO insurance, rate increases of 40 to 50%. We're seeing the failure of some companies and some impairments. So is something going on? Is it noise or is there a signal that's going on? And that's what we're going to explore in Highlight's presentation, which I'm giving today. There's a full study that's in front of you our street study on social inflation that's got more of the data and the arguments that are fleshed out, which is for you to take away and read at your leisure. But how are we going to explore social inflation? Well, by looking at four questions, basically. First, what is social inflation? Second, is it real? And third, if it's real, what drives it? What are the causes? And lastly, and probably most importantly, what can we do about it? First, what is it? What is social inflation? Well, simply defined, it's rises in liability loss costs that are higher than core inflation and consumer price index. So now we're hearing much about consumer price index going up 8% from shortages of key materials, building materials. Lee and I were talking about high cost of building materials for his stairs, getting skilled labor prices going up supply chain interruption, also the impact of the Russian invasion on Ukraine on the prices of wheat and soybeans and palladium, which go into catalytic converters, which drive up the cost of automobile physical damage replacement because of the theft in catalytic converters. Those are the economic components of, of inflation, the CPI and also the medical CPI. Social inflation, by contrast, is outside of those factors. So societal driven increases that derive from perceptions of what is the standard of care? What's the value of an injury? What's the value of a human life? Responsibility, negligence, these kinds of rises. So that's what it is. And is it real? Now, the reason I think this is an important question, is it real, is because not everyone is on board believing that there is something called social inflation. There is out there a group of people or their schools of thought, which I call social inflation deniers, just like you've got climate change deniers, there are social inflation deniers. And the denial argument is advanced most vociferously, most forcefully in so-called consumer advocacy organizations like the um, Consumer Federation of America and the Center for Justice and Democracy. And about a little bit over a year ago, these two organizations, the Consumer Federation of America and the Center for Justice and Democracy put out a report on social inflation and the title says it all. It is um, called um, Cash Rich Insurance Industry Fakes Crises and Invents Social Inflation. That's the title, pretty wordy title. They opened the report and it's a 67 page report. Just give you one the uh, paragraph gives you a sense of the contents of the report. You're invited to read it. I don't recommend it. It's available for free. But here are Bob Hunter. Many of you remember Bob Hunter from Texas days. In the current run-up to a new hard market, the insurance industry needed a new public relations term to make the case for rising rates. It settled on a new name to describe its current interest in raising prices, social inflation. But it's a hoax. It's a way for insurers to justify unnecessary rate hikes. Now, a lot of things wrong there, not just the tone, but social inflation is not a new term. It was first introduced in 1977 in Berkshire Hathaway's letter to shareholders, where Warren Buffett talked about social inflation and defined it just as I defined it before. So it's not an original term. So that's the um, uh, report that was put out by Consumer Federation of America, Center for Justice and Democracy, which by the way, is the rebranding of the old APLA, the American Trial Lawyers Association changed its name to CJD. And if we look at the context of 
these kinds of organizations or get a sense of where, where they come from. In the 1980s, when we had the great liability crisis, there were reports saying that there is no crisis, that it's just the greedy collusive insurance industry with its strange accounting practices trying to fleece ordinary citizens. Well, of course, that's not true. We know in the 1980s, there was a liability crisis when capacity dried up and we had 60 failures, 60 impairments of property casualty insurers between 1983 and 1985. And as we know from the AM Best reports on, on insurer impairments, there's typically only five or six impairments a year in our industry, 0.3% of property casualty insurers. And now these days, mainly Florida and some commercial auto. So 60 is a sign that something was going on. So that's the um, one school or sub-school of the social denier um, advocates. Another school, which is, I think, legitimate to think about, is that it's, it's not a structural change, it's cycle. You know, we know the insurance cycle, the familiar insurance cycle, soft market, hard market, but social inflation is maintained to be by proponents of this school, a manifestation of the tort cycle, where we have periods that are pro plaintiff and trial attorneys are getting big awards, followed by tort reforms that are introduced, which is what happened in the 1980s. And 15 years later, we had similar thing going on in California with MICRA and with caps on non-economic damages when Bush 43 was governor of Texas, tort reform brought down losses and claims quite a bit. And those were imported when he was in the White House. So we had tort reform there, pro-business climate and uh, pro-corporate. And that was followed in this tort cycle by a pro-plaintiff environment, which is more populist and which is more anti-corporate, which we saw beginning after the great financial crisis when corporations were viewed as intransparent and greedy and collusive and taking all these huge bonuses. And the uh, current environment is, one could argue, in the populist phase, where we had four years of the Trump administration, which was uncharacteristically populist for a Republican administration, somewhat anti-corporate, and now with the Biden administration, continuation of this, of this populist development. So, that's the school of thought saying that we've seen this movie before. It's a pendulum swing between tort reform and, and um, pro-plaintiff um, uh, periods. And there's a third school of thought, which is that there is, um, that the jury is still out, that we don't know if there is something going on. The numbers are not showing it. The actuaries are still looking at the numbers. As a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, I spoke to the Guy Carpenter um, strategic advisory team saying that they're looking at the data. They're looking for leading indicators. This is what people want. What are leading indicators for the next liability crisis? What do we look for? What's the canary in the coal mine? How do we know that something's going to happen? Because liability claims take time to develop. We've got the accident year versus the calendar year. And I recall Brian Dupereau saying once famously about insurance company financial statistics that in the insurance industry, the numbers don't reveal their secrets easily. And I would agree with that. But if you ask me where I come down, and I would say that social inflation is both real and that it is structural, that there are changes which we need to be concerned about because they are a change in the environment which is not something that's going back. And why do I say that? Well, last week when I was in Tallahassee testifying on the property insurance problems in Florida, my role was to explain why this is a crisis in Florida, why the Florida property insurance market is in the emergency room, why it's hanging on by a thread. And one of the things I pointed to was, was failures of companies. When companies start failing, then you know that there's something wrong in the industry. So in Florida, we had two impairments so far this year, St. John's, Avatar, FedNat was downgraded and is now non-renewing lots of its book. In 2021, there were two additional failures of property insurers in Florida. So something is going on there. 
Now, of course, Florida is a special case because of uh, the attorney fee multipliers and AOB, but there have been failures that we need to consider that indicate that there's something going on with social inflation, with these larger, with these larger kinds of claims, with these nuclear verdicts that are $10 million or more that are being seen in the numbers. And here, if we look at um, James River, reporting a 140% combined ratio in the fourth quarter, had commercial auto issues with the Uber account. And the other ones that I have identified are commercial auto related, Atlas Financial, American Transit, the New York company with its litigation. Of course, New York is a tough place to do commercial auto business, especially livery, which is its focus. You had at least four risk retention groups that failed in the last couple of years. The biggest one was the California-based Spirit, all commercial auto. Hallmark cut down or exited binding authority, primary commercial auto business. Protective, the old Baldwin and Lyons had poor results and was rolled into Progressive, which acquired it. So we had a couple of failures. Another place I look at, which other people haven't been talking about so much because it's a relatively recent phenomenon, is the runoff market. What's happening in the runoff market? Well, Randall and Quilter called off its IPO, which was about to happen. It got a $100 million capital injection to handle some of the back book on the Brandywine book, which, which is an old book of business it picked up from Ace about 15 years ago. So Randall and Quilter with some distress signs. Armor, taking heavy losses from its old one beacon US commercial insurance book. AXA, liability managers, no longer doing legacy deals. And deteriorating financial position at Arrowpoint and its subsidiary, Arrowwood, which had US business from Royal and Sun Alliance. A couple of years ago, of course, Tawa was put out for sale, not Tower, but Tawa, T-A-W-A, on the runoff side. So a number of develops, developments like that. So what is there to be worried about on, 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 the, um, on the legacy front? Well, the, the traditional bugbears are still with us, A&E, asbestos and environmental, and what about Reviver? What about the Reviver statutes in many states? 30, 40 years ago, people wouldn't think about suing their church. They had too much respect for the church. Whereas now with the Reviver statutes, people are coming out with vengeance and bringing forth these claims that are hitting many, many uh, insurers, including smaller insurers, and also um, construction defect, workers' compensation. So there's a lot of legacy liabilities that are out there, which explains, I think, why the legacy market has moved from a duopoly. It used to be that it was just NSTAR and Catalina, but now in the last couple of years, you had six or seven startups. So a lot of companies are thinking about these things and are looking for adverse development covers, lost portfolio transfers, novations, to the extent that there's concern about these kinds of exposures. So that's another source of evidence that I look to, because what I'm trying to do and what I try to do in the study is again, we're not advocacy, and I'm not telling anecdotes because I've got a particular review, but what does the data tell us? What are the facts that we can use as evidence? Because we want, we want this to be scientific and not confirming an opinion. And the, so the numbers, we want to look for the numbers, but I said, as I said before, the numbers don't reveal their secrets e easily. And a lot of the data on settlements, we know that over 90% of cases are settled out of court and don't go before juries and the numbers are confidential. So there's not really reliable data on settlements, but the data that I was able to find, I think paints a picture. The American Trucking Research Institute put, put together a report that was in, released about a year ago on nuclear verdicts in the trucking industry. They found that the average cost of a trucking claim in about the last decade has been going up 50% per year, 50%. So that's a lot higher than core inflation. So there's something going on there. And that number was picked up on shortly um, after in an excellent report that was co-authored by the III, the Insurance Information Institute, and the Casualty Actuarial Society. Co-author was Jim Lynch, who was the chief actuary at the, at the III. Picked up on that data 
and looked at the triangles and estimated that social inflation was responsible for about $20 billion of additional commercial auto claims. That's attributed to social inflation. Swiss Re picked up on this. Milliman also did a study and they saw that the lost development factors in the last couple of years for commercial auto and medical malpractice have gone up above the initial first picks. So we're seeing these reputable actuarial consulting firms that don't necessarily have a dog in the race coming out with these confirming reports on the existence and the dangers of social inflation. In my hometown of, of New York, we were talking about the subway with another fellow New Yorker here. The New York uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority has reported that personal injury payments went up from $43 million in 2017 to $150 million in 2019. And the um, Advisin, the Advisin, the New York-based insurance data provider that focuses on liability has estimated that the cost of a single fatality has gone up from one and a half million decade and a half ago to over $4 million today from the data that they have available. And we're also seeing something going on in the rates, especially for uh, directors and officers liability. So these are some of the reasons why I'm a believer and maintain that there is something going on that's structural. So. If it's real, if you're with me, what are its drivers? What are the causes of social inflation? Well, there are many, and there's many reports out there, too many reports maybe, but I find that the single largest, most important, most significant driver of social inflation is structural and behavioral change in the plaintiff bar. And what do I mean by that? Starting with, with structural change. Well, the plaintiff bar of today is not your father's or your grandfather's plaintiff bar. Whereas before you had small local night, night law school educated ethnic personal injury attorneys that took on a variety of cases, med mal, trip and fall, uh, sexual harassment, what have you. Now you have firms that are, that are feeders that pull in these cases and refer them as co-counsel to some significantly strong well-educated and well-financed plaintiff attorney firms. On the West Coast, we've got Lee Cabrazer. On the East Coast, close to me, uh, Koskoff and Koskoff. And again, these are really impressive plaintiff attorney firms. And there's a cooperation that's going on. Plaintiff attorneys sharing their practices, sharing their cases, sharing their philosophies and approaches to getting big verdicts. And it wasn't always this way. It wasn't always this way. The trial bar was typically very, very insular. And as a liability analyst, I was trying to get in there. Of course, I couldn't get into their conferences. I couldn't open their magazines because you had to be a, um, a plaintiff attorney to do that. Whereas now there's much more openness. And one of the remarkable things that I've encountered in my research are these two websites. One of them is triallawyernation.com triallawyernation.com. They're mentioned in, in the study there, so you don't have to write it down. And the other is triallawyerscollege.com. So these two websites, different websites, each of them has got about 100 or now over 100 podcasts that are about 45 minutes long or an hour long that feature interviews with some of the most successful trial lawyers in the country. And they tell their stories, they talk about the cases, they talk about how they do what they do, and it's really quite impressive. Once when I was researching the report, I binge watched a lot of those, those podcasts and really, really quite impressive. Some of these uh, folks are, are really talented and very aggressive, very aggressive. Um, so you have that, that different structure, which is contrast with a defense bar, which is more closed and not so co-op cooperative, it's more competitive because defense attorneys, defense panel counsel want to maintain their relationships with their insurer clients. Another structural change is migration in the market. You've had plaintiff attorneys that were focused on medical malpractice, medical professional liability, and found with the imposition of caps on non-economic damages that there are richer pools out there in other areas. So a lot of the talented Intelligent, successful med mal lawyers have gone into areas, practice areas like truck accident litigation, and also leaving the salaried world 
of the insurance company and going from the defense to plaintiff attorney uh, employment. So that's so those are some of the structural changes. And uh, there've, there've always been structural changes in the plaintiff bar. It evolves, it, well, we may have a different verb than evolve, but, um, but it changes over the years. I mean, if we remember Melvin Belly, who was the king of torts back in the day who introduced uh, implied warranty, that notion, and the um, Milberg Weiss dominating DNO litigation. So it's a different scene today. It's a different scene today. Structurally, it's different. And so that's the structure, the behavior. I said that one of the most important drivers of social inflation is the behavior of the plaintiff bar. And this is very important. There's been a shift in the emotion which plaintiff attorneys try to elicit from a jury of sympathy. It used to be you humanize the plaintiff, you elicit sympathy from the jury. Shift from sympathy to anger. Get the jury fired up, get them angry get them to want retributive justice. And this is an important shift, which is, which is worked on in, in, in different ways. Let me give you an example of a real life excerpt from a closing statement from a summation of a case that turned into a nuclear verdict. So this is the summation to the, to the, the jurors before they go off to decide. A corporation isn't like an individual. It doesn't have a heart. It doesn't have a brain. You can't punish it the way that you punish a child or the way that you punish an adult. The only way to punish a corporation is in their pocketbook. Hmm. Pretty eloquent stuff. Gets the jury fired up. But you know, but there's a couple of problems with this kind of summation. First of all, the use of the word punishment is inappropriate because tort law is not meant to punish. It's meant to compensate. And then procedurally, Rule 403 of the federal laws of um, federal procedure stipulate that evidence may not be introduced, which leads to a decision based purely on emotional reasons. And if this isn't emotional, I don't know what is. So th there's violations of, of trial practice that are going on, and they're using this kind, this kind of anger. And not just, as I said before, you know, humanizing the, um, the plaintiff, but also dehumanizing the defendant. So I've seen statements, I've seen transcripts where the uh, plaintiff attorney is accusing the, the defendant or the insurance company of being inhuman or subhuman or um, evil. So to dehumanize the defendant, whereas the defendants are, are companies that are in your towns that have been there, family-owned businesses that help the community. And there's an opportunity for defense attorneys to humanize the defendant. But they're up against these talented actor plaintiff attorneys that are dehumanizing defense. So this is what's going on and it's going on quite a lot. And I've seen a lot of it in those kind of videos which I was binge watching. So that's really at the heart of it. And some of the manifestations the ways that it's shown is use of the reptile theory. The reptile theory, a book 2009 by Ball and Keenan, which has pseudoscience maintaining that in the back of your brain somewhere, there's this vestigial part of the brain which is related to reptiles when, when we were reptiles. And it's my brain, not yours, of course. Um, again, which is pseudoscience. And uh, this notion that we have this vestigial part of the brain which causes us to lash out at situations which are unsafe and to destroy the agents of this, this danger and safety. So they maintain that corporations are putting profits over people, that they, uh, the role of the juror is to punish the defendant. So this is the, the reptile theory, which has been tremendously successful. And I'm sure that your claims folks have, have encountered this. And that was 13 years ago, 2009. Since then, the plaintiff bar has introduced something which is called a psychodrama. So if one goes to the Trial Lawyers Academy out in uh, Wyoming, set up by Jerry Spence of OJ Simpson fame, they're teaching classes on psychodrama, which is a combination of applied human psychology and drama. And when I mean drama, they bring in trained actors, successful actors from Broadway, from, from the theater that teach plaintiff attorneys the dramatic arts. 
so that they use their expressions, their gestures, their faces, their motions to elicit an emotional response. So psychodrama is all the rage. And for the last couple of years that people were wearing masks, there was a caught there's a course that was taught there on how to use psychodrama with just your eyeballs because your face was covered. They couldn't see your, your expression. So using the eyes to somehow get at the heartstrings of the jury. Uh, another manifestation is anchoring. Anchoring, which is putting a number in the minds of the jurors early and often, early even in voir dire, in the jury selection process. Are you comfortable asking for $10 million? Can you ask for $10 million? You think $10 million is a good number for this case? $10 million, think about it. And then when they come down to decide, the number which actually comes out of the juror pool is, is close to that 10 million. This was shown by a study that was done by this good defense firm on Long Island, Schaub Amity. So anchoring works, anchoring works. So these are some of the behavioral changes. Uh, other kinds of drivers of social inflation. One is attorney advertising. Attorney advertising, I travel a lot these days and when I get to the airport, I hop into a taxi, I go to the hotel or the office and I look out the window and I count the billboards, the plaintiff advertising billboards, not just your national firms, your Morgan and Morgans, but all these local ones, they're, they're everywhere. They're on the sides of buses. They're on the benches for bus stops, radio and television and internet and telephone. And I've been getting a lot of phone calls now that I've been working from home. A couple of weeks ago, I was up early in the morning and um, I, get, I got an email from uh, the local law firm saying, you know, would you like to learn about mesothelioma? And I was like, okay, you know, I'm an analyst and I study this kind of stuff. I'd love to learn about mesothelioma. So I wrote back, said, yes, I'd like to learn. And then within a few minutes, I get these um, chat boxes that are popping up on my computer. They want to chat with me. Would you like to talk to a live person now? Well, it's better than talking to a dead person, right? So I said, yes, I'd love to talk to someone about mesothelioma. So I get them on the phone and um, the, um, um, right, they wanted to see if I, I, I would qualify for the money. It was all about the money. You know, it didn't talk about responsibility. You know, is there anyone you know that has these symptoms? But it was, okay, there's $30 billion out there and you can have a piece of it. So this was not happening 10, 20 years ago because these people did not have the, ability to know where I lived and where was the closest law firm that is a feeder for some of these big ones that put together a class action. So technology has helped with attorney advertising. And if we're talking about data to back up my allegations or argument that there is something going on here, the spending, advertising spending by attorneys is measured by some organizations. And we're seeing the increase because it is effective. I think Morgan & Morgan spends over $100 million a year in advertising. So you've had this explosion in attorney advertising and uh, the numbers to prove it. Another driver is the emergence and the growth and the use of litigation financing, otherwise known as litigation funding. So these parties that collect party dollars from third, third parties that are looking for uncorrelated asset classes that are uncorrelated with capital markets are investing in lawsuits. Uh, Burford Capital is publicly traded. They're the biggest one. Uh, in the last couple of months, Burford had a $250 million capital raise. Other litigation funders raised over a billion. So all this money is coming in to invest in lawsuits. And with all this money coming in, chasing limited suits, then what does that mean? It means that it's gonna go down to the lower quality suits. So more of the frivolous suits, more of the meritless suits are going to be invested in because you've got all this money that's chasing them. And you know, a couple of days after my report on social inflation was published, Swiss Re came out with a report on litigation funding in their Sigma series, you know, good, good research there. And within days, Burford and Parabellum and other litigation funding firms were attacking the Swiss Re report saying that we're not responsible. We don't do ordinary torts. We just do commercial litigation, intellectual property, and those sorts of things. But that's not true. If you look at the um, uh, 
websites of some of the largest litigation funders, they identify cases that they're, they're going on. So litigation funding, which has grown, is um, another, another uh, driver. And you also have some of the societal drivers, you know, the, the Bronx jury hypothesis. The Bronx jury hypothesis maintains that juries are ways to redistribute wealth, where you have big differences between the rich and the poor. Juries are, are a way of redistributing it to people that are, that are more needy. And this was analyzed in the Geneva Association, International Insurance Research Organization, that did a good study on social inflation about a year ago. And they advanced this hypothesis, hypothesis uh, that it's going on around the world. But what about in the United States? If we look at the, um, the states that have got the, the worst liability climates, the Institute for Legal Reform, the ILR, which is a branch of the US Chamber, puts out every two years a ranking, a state liability ranking, to see which states are the most friendly to businesses and which are the most inimical to businesses. You find that the ones that were towards the bottom, West Virginia, Missouri, Louisiana, and um, Mississippi, which are really towards the bottom, are states whose Gini coefficient is associated with the biggest difference between rich and poor. So there could be some legs to that theory, which was advanced by Geneva Association in the United States, which was described colloquially as the Bronx jury hypothesis by, in a novel by, by Tom Wolfe, that who experienced those things. So that's another driver as well. The, um, uh, uh, the, the societal attitudes. And let me give you just a couple more. One, which is important, many of you no doubt are seeing it on the claim side, phantom damages. Phantom damages represent the difference between medical costs that are billed versus medical costs that are paid. Because as we know, medical bills are severely discounted, but in a court, the amount paid doesn't have to be disclosed, just the amount that's billed. So it's like in this hotel, I look behind my door and the rack rate of the hotel for a standard room is $850. I don't think anyone that paid for their room is paying $850 a night, but that is the, uh, the rack rate. And that's what's shown on a lot of the bills that are being presented in court that include unnecessary soft tissue surgeries, which can cost $100,000 or multiple surgeries or surgeries that were never performed or excessive imaging, MRIs and CAT scans. Uh, and insurers are getting hit with those larger numbers. Many states allow phantom damages and they don't allow the amount that was actually paid. So phantom damages is, is another driver that's impacting multiple liability lines, especially those, of course, that have got third-party bodily injury. And finally, and perhaps a little bit controversially, one of the drivers, we've talked a lot about the plaintiff bar today, is the defense bar. What's going on in, in the defense bar? And I've talked to a lot of defense attorneys and people in, in claims departments from major insurers, and I heard the story that's consistent through many of the discussions that the defense bar has been slow to react and that they're more focused on LAE and spend than on the indemnity. And the attitude is that, well, we can't control indemnity, but we can control the spend. We're gonna spend less money on, on uh, uh, mock trials. We're gonna spend less money on witnesses. We're not gonna get the most qualified witnesses that have got knowledge about this particular case. We're gonna get someone that's available, that's cheaper, because you wanna bring the cost down. So that's being penny wise and pound foolish. And it's hard to get those folks to speak on the record about that because they don't want me to publish something that would damage their reputation with the carriers that are being cheap with, with, their, uh, with their services. Uh, but this is something which many people are saying, and I did get, and it's in the report, several comments which are, on the record. Uh, an insurer said in a recent podcast, this is no secret. Defense lawyers are more academic, more rule following, and not willing to bend the rules. Another defense attorney maintained that carriers are very concerned about how much they spend on legal. They're more concerned about that and not concerned evidently as the cost of indemnification. Pretty strong stuff. 
the Geneva Association, which put together that report on social inflation said, a very cost control mindset of insurer claims departments, commercial sensitivity over sharing information, together with a dose of complacency have meant that the plaintiff bar has forged ahead in recent years, leaving the defense bar scrambling to play catch up. And this relates to the structure, to the compensation structure of the defense bar salary by the hour versus eat what you kill 30% contingency fee. So this is an area which a little bit uncomfortable for people to read, but as this report has been out and I've been speaking, seeing a lot of nodding heads that defense bar needs to up its game because the plaintiff bar has been doing all these things and investing in uh, mock trials, using dollars from litigation financing, manipulating the emotions, the heartstrings, eliciting anger, coming up with new legal theories. So changes that are going on, which are not matched by the defense bar. The defense bar can't take these kinds of chances because those don't want to lose big at a trial, so they settle. And it's the threat of a jury uh, trial which drives people to settle. And so, as we know, most of the dollars are in the settlements. Most of those big uh, verdicts are reduced in remitter. But when you've got a $10 million verdict reduced in remitter to $3 million, but it's only worth half a million dollars, that's a win for the plaintiff bar, and especially if it's in punitive damages. We've got punitive, non-economic, and compensatory. Big dollars are typically ending up in the punitive and the non-economic. So that's my take on, on the drivers. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? What can be done? Well, I would say advocacy is important. Advocacy is important, and it's going on. Um, associations, individual insurers are advocating in state courts for prohibitions of, of three things which I've talked about. Anchoring is in statute, whether it's allowed or not. Litigation financing, whether it's disclosed or not, that there's third party capital in this case. Um, and uh, phantom damages too. So there's like a, uh, a checkerboard, if you look at the states in the United States, some states allow these, some don't, some are mixed, and there's advocacy that's going on to restrict some of these uh, actions and trends, which, which are excesses in, in many ways. And the formation of coalitions, it's not just individual uh, insurers and, the, and their associations, but there's other interested parties as well, because this just, just doesn't hurt insurance companies it hurts society by driving up the cost of goods because when companies get hit with these kinds of uh, lawsuits and the rates go up, drives up the cost and contributes to core inflation, which is of course a big concern. So for society, it's important to, um, to work on these things, to recognize them, to educate, and also to make the changes in, in the defense bar which are needed in the trial practice. So to object, and to object often when rules are violated, where in, in New York state where I'm from, there's a prohibition about uh, excessive damages. They have to be reasonable, reasonable damages. What's the definition of reasonable? And as we said before, rule 503 of the rules, civil rules of evidence about not allowing evidence, which can lead to a purely emotional decision. So the defense bar, I argue, has got to up its game in a number of ways as well. And I think we've learned a lot since the last liability crisis uh, and uh, some of the things which, which we've talked about today, I hope that are useful for you. I'm gonna be around here through tomorrow morning if you wanna talk to me, um, if you don't have a chance to ask a question now, happy to talk to you and learn from you about what you're seeing because that's what matters, what's real out there. And we've got about five minutes for questions as planned. So happy to take your questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the ice on questions. So Dave. It sounded like, like you said, we're too nice and not aggressive enough. But I have to admit your solutions sound like it's more of the industry being nice and not aggressive enough against an extremely aggressive you know, <laughs> trial attorneys. Are we seeing any evidence of the, the education and the public policy and those 
those items you talked about as what we can do to fight back? Have, is that working yet? Or are, are we still a bunch of kind of nice people who don't want to get down dirty with what amounts to, uh, you know, a trial attorney? Yeah, I, I would agree that the, um, it's, it's a different game. Just like when you have a, a soccer team, when one team is, is fouling at all times or, or flopping and, and really bending the rules or, or cheating, um, and I think the, um, the, the defense bar does need to be more aggressive. I mean, you asked about education. There's a, um, you know, not educating about the things I'm talking about, but if you look at the education of, of trial attorneys, the traditionally uh, from smaller law schools, from night law schools, come up from hardship, not from the white shoe firms. I mentioned the word complacent came in the Geneva Association. Um, so they, they, they can't just be good white shoe defense attorneys with a comfortable, cozy existence. You need, need to play tougher. Um, and, and there are some insurers that, that don't take it and are really aggressive about fighting back. I think of prime insurance, commercial auto insurers, uh, insurer that, that fights everyone. And they've got a combined ratio in the 70s. Um, you know, Rick Lindsay. It works. Not a lot of companies do that. They're not quite as feisty. Um, and, and there have been successes as well uh, with advocacy. I'm not that, that familiar with education, but certainly education would help to let people know that these things are going to cost us. They're going to make us less competitive as a country. They're going to cause businesses to move from one place to another. Uh, and there have been some victories in, in different areas in uh, Missouri, uh, maintain the non-economic damages in Montana, they eliminated phantom damages. So I'm really scraping the bottom when I've got to talk about you know, Montana and its you know, small population as one of the victories, but this, this needs to continue. This needs to continue and, and to, um, uh, to, to educate legislators, because as I saw last week in Tallahassee, when I was talking to the, the Florida State Senate, a lot of people there did not understand the basics of insurance and, and why insurance companies are raising their rates. Um, so something that's a bit more arcane like this certainly demands another level of education. And you've got the chamber doing its job with the Institute of Legal Reform. ILR produces a lot of good literature, but it's got to get out there. It's got to get out there. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Yes, sir. I've never been the quiet one. I didn't think that was a problem. Um, with respect to third party funded litigation for trial attorneys, for the plaintiff's attorney, um, do you think disclosing that lends credibility to the jury that the trial should exist or that do you think it hurts them more? You, as a jury member, do you think seeing that will take some of the steam out of the plaintiff or do you think it adds credibility to the plaintiff? I, I think it detracts from, from credibility because by virtue of the relationship being disclosed, it becomes apparent that the attorney-client privilege could be violated. The decisions are made by parties that control the assets that have got the capital and can steer the litigation in a particular case. So just seeing that, Sunlight is the best disinfectant, which is why the, the uh, litigation financing community is so adamant about not having their involvement disclosed. They don't want to be seen because it's not clean, I maintain. They have a lot of counter literature out there, but it can all be rebutted. If it looks like a skunk, walks like a skunk. Other questions? We've got time for, I think, for two more. Yes, yes, ma'am. We have some online questions. So how many, how much regional variation do you think there is for social inflation? California, Texas, New York, and Florida causing a lot more problems than other states? Question mark. Big difference between urban and rural areas. Yeah, thanks. There's, there's a lot of variation. Texas has gotten it under control quite a bit because they've had a number of reforms prior to which they were suffering from some of the same 
issues that Florida is having now with the roofing contractors, the roofing contractors knocking on doors and saying, I can get you a new roof. So Texas put the kibosh on that to a certain extent. So Florida is the one that was totally out of control, which is why I'm happy that we got some reform done in, uh, in Florida with the um, contingency fee multipliers, which are supposed to be only for rare and exceptional events. But Florida is still in the emergency room. Um, California just released the $250,000 cap on uh, non-economic damages for medical malpractice from the old MICRA and counter it. So you'd think that, okay, fine, if now it's higher than 250, they're gonna be paying more. But I've seen arguments out there saying that it's actually going to improve the situation because doctors knowing that there was only the possibility of a quarter of a million dollars of being levied against them got a little bit sloppy. So now that they know that there's more money uh, available, then they're gonna be more careful in their, in their professional work as, as physicians. Um, so there, there's a fair amount of, veter, of variation. Unfortunately, it's, it's something that requires a multi-line carrier to look at every state individually and it causes analysts like me, I need to spend a lot more time looking at individual states because it's not a national thing. But yeah, the differences are, are strong, which is why I like to look at things like the Institute for Legal Reform state liability rankings and, and some of the, some of the uh, analysis there on, on a state basis. New York is pretty bad. New York has got scaffold law. New York has got uh, food labeling and it's got uh, disabled people uh, or people that are not disabled looking for accommodations for uh, disabled people, even though they've never been there or not disabled themselves. So New York has got a host of problems. Um, so yeah, a lot of variation. One last one. Jerry, just looking at the data, how much of the, infl the social inflation is driven by you know, more volatility or more catastrophic awards versus, you know, 500 becomes a 750, a 750 becomes a million, a million becomes a million and a half. Um, can, can you describe the, you know, the kind of total effect between those, those two things? Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's, it's a great question because for the last couple of years, uh, people were talking about nuclear verdicts. You know, go to your reinsurers, um, talk to your Swiss Re's and Gen Re's and Munich Re's. You know, how many cases do you have that are, that are you know, worth over 10 million or um, compared to 10 years ago. And people were focused on nuclear verdicts. But what I'm hearing lately is that in the layer below that, you've got this the same kind of inflation as well, where your trip and fall might have been 75,000 and now it's 500,000. So it's not you know, making those headlines that a nuclear case will, but I think it's happening at both levels. So it's bleeding into the layer before and people are being desensitized to, to the numbers like, hey, this case went for 12 million. 